Hello and welcome again to Conscious TV. My name is Ian McNay and today we're going to have a discussion about the Enneagram and our guest is Ginger Lapid Bogda. Hi Ginger. And you're very prolific because you've written three books on the Enneagram. First one, Bringing Out the Best in Everyone You Coach, based on the Enneagram. What type of leader are you? And Bringing Out the Best in Yourself at Work. So, and you've also got various packs here we'll look at later. So let's just start as we normally do on Conscious TV about how this all began with, for you in terms of your spiritual journey, so as to speak. And I think you were saying earlier that actually you're about seven years old that you started to get in touch with what we might call the bigger picture. Right. I remember when I was doing my PhD work at the University of uh, California in Santa Barbara, the pro major professor there said that he didn't think people became conscious or spiritual until they got were adults. And I was like, oh, well, that wasn't my experience. And my experience was born of being um, brought into a family, the youngest of five children, and uh, the family was highly dysfunctional, but it didn't appear so on the outside. But inside, there were a number of things that were very troubling. And being the youngest, and I was sort of watching everything and looking at it and sometimes the recipient of a lot of this and other times it was my siblings and I became very reflective. I remember even at seven years old thinking about the meaning of life, thinking about why people did what they did, thinking about the potential of people to do their best and what sometimes caused them not to do so. And so I found a lot of solace in um, the solitude and the self-reflection and I remember believing that at that time that there was a bigger universe and a bigger consciousness and a bigger purpose to it all. And that I was, I remember thinking, I'm too young to know it yet, but I know there is something there. So this was kind of instinctive? Or, yes, yeah. it was very instinctive. And I do think children have it. My son, who's now 19, he was very conscious, um, had the same sense when he was four years old. Right. So I yeah. really do believe that, you know, it's, it's out there. It's in there. And did you did you have relationships with other kids who felt the same way or thought the same way? Um, well, I was raised in the late four, 1940s, early 50s, and we didn't talk about those things. Yes. That's so true. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I think that children now do talk about it more. I remember when my son was in third grade, um, his teacher saw this special quality in him, and they put him in touch with another child in the classroom who had the same quality so that they could be together and just um, not feel like they saw the world in such a different way from other people. But I think uh, there's an increasing awareness of the bigger consciousness that's available now that wasn't talked about then. Did you feel isolated as such or did you feel okay with I felt protected. Mm, I didn't feel isolated. Yeah. I felt very protected. Okay, so you mentioned when you were in university, when you were, I think, 19 years old, you um, started to get political. Well, I went to the University Berkeley, B Berkeley, Berkeley, yeah. in the 1960s. And my yeah. very first year was the, the two months start into it, the free speech movement, which started all the political activism in the United States, was really about ironically, um, computer cards. And we weren't computer cards with little punched out chads. We were people. And um, it was the beginning of a sort of a political consciousness. Although I'd been, my parents were politically active. So I had been active as a child in political causes. But it was a big awakening for me. And so I then, you know, got very involved in, you know, just social action, civil rights, um, the anti-Vietnam War movement, to some, not quite, but a little bit later, the women's movement that grew out of the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement in the United States. So I definitely got so, you know, politically involved. I know it was the same for me when I was, when I was young. I also got very politically involved, involved with the left-wing left political movement in, in England. And, and I kind of, the way I saw things there was what the system had to change and then people would be happier and better off. But it took me a few years to realize that actually you couldn't do it for people. People had to want to 
change from the inside and then that was when my spiritual journey started. I had to go through this process of seeing that something else didn't work first. Was that at all similar for you? No. You, it was it a different wasn't process. Like that. It's similar yeah. but it's different and I, um, I, the best I can say it is my son, I love my son very much and he was a very wise child and when he was five years old he said, Mommy, is there a God? And I said, that's something you have to discover. And when he was seven, he said, Mommy, I figured out the answer. And I said, <laughs> to what? You know, there was a two-year gap. But for him, it was an ongoing process. He said, God is something inside you. And God is also in the bigger universe. And the challenge in this lifetime for each of us is to connect with the universal force inside us and the universal energy outside us and to make that connection. Mm. And Okay, but I feel like that's true in terms of how I see the consciousness um, evolution and change is that it, there is, if it's just done on the outside in organizations or society or nations, whatever, it's not enough if organizations become more conscious and if people inside organizations become more conscious, eventually they will change the organization, but it takes a long time. So my focus is both the system and the individual and bringing the two together. Okay. So to follow your story in sequence, you got married, and you married <laughs> someone you thought that was a prince. And he turned out to be a big toad. A big toad. So that must have been a big disappointment. Yes, because the dream was very large, and the reality was very harsh. Yes. And I, um, I, I, I I didn't consciously know this about him at the time, but he was very abusive psychologically and physically. And that was the first time, it wasn't the first time I had experienced some psychological abuse because that had occurred in my family, but it was the very first time that I had experienced any physical abuse from anyone. Um, and this is, if I can put it into the late 1960s, 70s, nobody was talking about this. So I, and I moved to a new city, so I knew no one, I was in graduate school. But at first, I didn't know really what, I got very disoriented by it and very discouraged and depressed. And then I started to realize that this was not how I wanted to live my life. And so that ended, I ended the marriage. But after that, I realized that at some level, I had chosen him, not knowing consciously, but unconsciously. And there was some energy that in me that attracted him to me, et cetera. And that was the, big beginning of my psychological and the connection between my psychological and spiritual growth was a big awakening of um, I want to live a life that is satisfying and rich in, in experience and rich in spirit and rich in not money was never an issue, the issue of richness but a very vibrant life and I need to take responsibility for my conscious and my unconscious choices. So somehow you were uh almost relying or expecting to find happiness in the relationship with him. Right. And you realize actually it has different roots, happiness. It has to come from within. Yeah. Okay, that's a, that's, a, that's a big lesson, isn't it? It was a hard one, but a rich yeah. one. I, yeah. I look back on it and I think it was the, one of the best things that ever happened to me. Yeah. Because it really woke me up. That's a great attitude to have. Well, yeah, I feel blessed with that. But I suppose I had no choice. In a way, I had a two choices, <laughs> this or that. So, given well, the there's choice. a lot of people that kind of collapse into the victim thing and affects them for years and years, and they right. maybe try and do some therapy. And it takes a lot of courage, a lot of insight, and a much bigger overview to see actually, well, I get something out of this, even though it's very difficult at the time, right. and I can learn through this, and I can grow, and I can right. move forward. So, and then you were working with kids who uh, deprived kids in, in a sort of poor urban environment. So, what attracted you to that? Well, that was my social action. I believed that, and I still do, that education is the path to choice and to um, do what you want with your life and do what you want in the world. So, I went into an urban, urban environment and I actually never thought of them as deprived. I just thought of them as poor and urban. And most of them were African Americans because it was in the city of Philadelphia. And I had a blessed experience there. 
I made contact with all the families. I got to know the children. Um, I saw the beauty in them and the belief in them, and they were amazing learners. But I also saw how if I set up the classroom environment, you see here we go into the system structure, in a certain way, they could actually get really motivated and learn and enjoy themselves and feel fulfilled. And if I also worked on them individually to find um, the best in themselves, it was the, again the system and the individual coming together. And I still have some contact with some of them. I, they're right. like adults now. They right. were probably concerned with almost right. middle aged. Yeah. But I remember I just got a um, Facebook message from one of them. His sister actually contacted me, and I, his name is Lamont. And he said, um, he's doing very well. And he said, I just remember your smile. It's like no matter what was going on, you believed in me maybe more than I believed in myself, and your smile made everything okay. And it's like, this is probably kind of the key to how you work now, I would guess, we'll come to that later. Right. You, you have the ability to spot a potential in a situation, whether it be in a kid or a, a, you know, an adult or in an organization, and it's kind of feeding that potential right. can, so it can grow, not because of you, but right. you're, kind of, you're kind of helping it to see That's, that it can grow on its own. Yes. Yeah. So, um, and then you actually did go, 1972 I think it was, you did go into work with businesses. Yes. So I how did. was that to start with? Interesting. I, it was interesting. I, I think that organizations, because I've always been involved with organizations, partly because I'm fascinated intellectually. I find the way they work amazing. But also because it's where people congregate. And I've been about always trying to help organizations be more effective, more productive, more conscious, and more humane, and to help people in them be the same. So for me, to be able to work in an organization and do that, it, it's like, I, on the underground, I'm a social subtype, so it's sort of like, I like to help individuals, but I also, more individuals that can be helped, the better, and so what better place than organizations? Okay. Um, and just give us practically an example of some of the things that you actually did. You go in there, you help organizations. What did you actually do to start with? Well, I mean, it's, it's a 35-year profession, so it can go for anywhere from working with an individual and in leadership coaching to working with organization restructures, strategy, organization design, you know, and everything in between. But um, I don't come in as the expert. I come in as a maybe an expert in processes to help them figure it out themselves. So I don't help them tell them what their strategy should be. I help them get the information that will help them design their own strategy. So it's again, it's taking the potential that's right. there and giving them Ex suggested guidelines so yes. they can it can evolve. Yeah. Yeah. And then I know in. 1992, you were Esselin in, <laughs> in Big Sur, and there was uh, you wanted to do a workshop. You've done all the workshops that were listed apart from one on the Enneagram. Right. So you went to this workshop. Tell us what happened. Well, I was just looking for a vacation. Not everyone goes to Esselin for well, a vacation. Well, my idea of a vacation is to go in some place that's very beautiful and also do some spiritual work, psychological work, something. You know, sometimes like it could be all by myself, but so that is my idea of a vacation. So I end up in this Enneagram workshop that's on the brochure. It says that it's an, a beginning one, so that's me. And I get there and it's advanced. And I'm like, oh my goodness. And everybody's talking about numbers. And I'm, so did you know what the Enneagram was? No, not really. Uh, somebody said you might like this. I had had. A few friends from college who had gone and worked with Oscar Chazo in Eureka, and they had told me a little about it, but they weren't supposed to talk about it. So I said, it's really great, but I can't talk about it. Okay. So I was interested, pot, you know, and I figured if I wasn't, I would just not go to the sessions and just sit outside in the hot tubs and the, eat the good food. But anyway, the first day I was like, oh, these numbers people are throwing around. I'm not, I don't really like systems of personality because I feel that they can restrict people into not being all of who they are. And we so can what you were learning, because there'll be people watching this program that don't know what the Enneagram is, so just explain very basically what you learned in the first couple of days. Well, the first couple of days I learned that there's numbers and people identified with them, but by the third day I went, this is amazingly profound. So I had shifted from, I'm not sure about this, to 
this is pretty very profound. So you want me to, it would be helpful if I explain the nine styles. No, I'm just, I'm just putting it in a context now that the, the theory of the Enneagram is this nine different personality types. Well, yes. Well, the theory of the Enneagram is that we have these nine different personality types and each of us is fundamentally oriented to have a certain worldview and a certain drive that comes from one of these nine styles. But that you sh we are not limited by our Enneagram type. In fact, it's not actually all of who we are and that there is a deeper self that wants to emerge beyond some of the restrictions of our Enneagram style. So if we know our Enneagram style, it helps us identify our patterns of thinking, feeling, and behaving and to see the interrelationship between the two so that we can appreciate ourselves for what we do bring but also not so identify with our personality so that we can actually work on development um, in terms of um, expanding our patterns of thinking, feeling, and behaving. One of my colleagues refers to our Enneagram types as a clothing we wear. Okay. Okay. So that it's not that we want to take off all our clothes, but that we can, in fact, change and grow. That there, it's not something, even though our Enneagram style is something that we have our lifetime and it's a continuous process of evolution, we are not fundamentally stuck in our patterns. Okay, so at this workshop you learned about these nine styles. I right. presume, was it quite easy to find your style? Well, at first, actually, I thought I might be an Enneagram style four, but as I worked, after about 10 years of working with the system, I realized that the fours and the twos are very um, similar in some ways and very different in others, and I started doing all the development work for the four, and after a while it lifted and it doesn't, wasn't working anymore, and I found there was a two underneath the four, that, but because my family had been challenging, the four had made a little more sense in that family system. But, but there is a story I'd like to share when I left yes. this, the yeah. uh, Esalen experience. So I went into this for my own personal development. I had no, again, just a vacation. So I walk out of the room and literally, my eyes are wide open, but in my mind's eye, I saw a blimp or a dirigible, you know, one of these air, uh, sort of, they look like um, an airplane, but they have no wings. They float in air. Okay, yeah. Do you say dirigible? Uh, it's not a word I know. Oh, you don't. Don't, well, don't worry about it. must be a British word for it. Yeah. Anyway, and it was carrying a banner, and the banner, you know, in the back, of a message, and the message said, "Your mission or your job is to bring the enneagram more into the world." And I just was like taken, and I said, "But that's not my plan." And it came back a second time, and it huh. said, "It doesn't matter what your plan is." I'm like, am I tired or, you know, it's like 12 in the afternoon? I don't know. So then it comes, I go, well, that's good because it's, I'm not, what am, but what am I supposed to do? And it came back a third time and it said, um, just be patient, it'll be clear to you. So I said, well, that's good because now I don't, and then everything that I, have a couple years, you know, just stuff started to happen and I realized what I was supposed to do. So I feel like I'm on sort of, some sort of plan that's bigger than me. So you then started to incorporate what you learned from that Esling workshop about the Enneagram in your work working with businesses and individuals. Well, yes, but the interesting thing is that after that program, I decided I wanted to learn it better and deeper. Yes. So, and because Helen Palmer had been the leader of that workshop, I went into her training program in California. And part of the program to be certified was you have to, you had to type 20 people, and 10 of them during this time had to be on tape so that you had somebody supervise. Now, 20 people is a lot of people, really. Um, I started running out of family and friends who were willing to be typed and interested to be so. So I asked several of my clients, and it was my clients, after I typed them, I would give them a book as a thank you for the time, and they asked me to work with them on how to use it in organizations. So see, it wasn't my plan to do so, but my clients said, well, gee, um, let's see if we can figure out how to use it with our te this, my team. How, let's see how we can do this. Let's see how we can use it for conflict. So that's how my path evolved. It was through my clients. Okay. So let's just explain relatively briefly about the nine different types mm -hmm. and how just some clues about how people might be able to find their type. I realize it's probably not going to get detailed enough for someone to spot it from this program, but right. just, just maybe a few minutes explaining in a little okay. more detail what the whole thing is. 
Okay, so the idea is that um, on the Enneagram symbol, we are all human, and so there's a circle that relates to our both our universal humanness and the fact that in some ways we have all of the nine styles within us, yet at the same time we're more fundamentally wired to one of the nine. And the reason for understanding which one is more our wiring is because once we understand it, it helps us clarify and become more conscious of our patterns of thinking, feeling, behaving. But also, each Enneagram style, there are certain development activities that work really well for one style and are not necessarily useful for another in terms of evolving our, and growing and expanding and becoming more conscious. So I'll go through the nine styles yes, very briefly. Yeah. And what I'll try to do is give a, a business example. for, okay. And the, I, I find them rather amusing. So anyway, Enneagram, I'll start with one. Enneagram style ones believe that the world could potentially be perfect, but of course, in reality, they are quite aware that it's not. So they feel that it's their job to improve themselves, other people, and circumstances. And this is, of course, a li lifelong work to try to keep improving things and make it perfect because as soon as you perfect one thing, another thing pops up. And so they were are very diligent and responsible. So um, to give you an example of an Enneagram style one, um, a manager who had at least 70 people reporting to him was describing this in a group. He said, well, I'm very good at delegating. And so his peers, who weren't so sure of that was accurate, said, really? And she said, yes, I can delegate it to anybody who can do it better than I am, than I can. Right. And they said, well, how many people is that? And he said, two. And then his peers said, well, what about people who can do it as well as you? Well, maybe I could do this. And so then he said, and how, well, maybe, but and how many is that? Five. And so... I said to him, well, you know, part of a manager or leader's job is to develop people who work for you. So that do you think you could consider the possibility of delegating to people who could do it 70, 80 percent as well as you and give them that growth or stretch? And he said, I'd really have to think about this seriously. Now, he was very serious, but it was amusing to others. It was very hard to him, for him to let go of getting it done right and a sort yeah. of an assurance that only he or a few select others could do so. That's so a clue for number one is perfection. Yes, but also seeking perfection, but also knowing at some level that nothing is ever really perfect enough. Yes. Because ones will be the first to tell you they're not perfect. Okay. What works is, what's important is that you're constantly trying to make things more or so. Okay, so number, so two, number two. twos. Well, Enneagram number twos, style twos, they have this bigger sense that there's a bigger purpose to everybody's life and, and meaning. And so they feel that their job is to help people find that and to help you know, reduce suffering in the world and to find out what people need and to satisfy it. And they like to orchestrate and make things better, uh, preferring to do it behind the scenes to out front and visible. And so what they do is they focus on other people so much and organizations and groups and others that they spend less time figuring out what is it that I need? What is it that I really is, I'm about? What is my bigger purpose? So just to give you an example, um, a manager, a high-level manager was saying to his managers, I need some help. I'm very, very busy. Could you do this for me? And there were, you know, eight or nine people in the room. So one person said, yes, I could do some if you give me a couple of days notice. And another person said, not now, but next week go around and the leader who was the two said well I can help you now because I always al give allow a couple of extra hours in my schedule just so I can help you and he was as busy as anybody else and everybody was laughing about this but it's the way twos think for him his helping his boss was critically important but of course he was exhausted yes and then he actually the same person had a, a difficulty in his life where somebody very close to him had died and yet he sort of kept going and people were saying, let, let, us, let, me, let us take care of you a little bit. And he was like overwhelmed by it and didn't quite know what to do with it, all the support. Yeah, so they're focused out there yes. rather than also rather than than in here. Yeah. Okay, number three. Number threes, Enneagram style threes believe that they, they're looking for a natural order and flow in the world and a sort of a way, a systematic way that things work moving forward and they can't quite find it. So they feel that their job is to create goals and get results and to create a plan to get there. So 
And in the process, they can end up being very high achieving and very successful, but they can lose sight, almost like a horse in a race, lose sight of the, with blinders on about what's going on both around them with other people particularly, and also what's going on internally with them. So let me give you an example of something that was very moving to me. Um, I've been doing, I do work with uh, management teams with the Enneagram and the development um, usage. And one of the men in, the, in this group was, was a three. And he was pretty driven and pretty successful. And one day he came to this group that had been ongoing of leaders, leadership community. And people said, looked at him and they said, you seem really different. What happened? And he said, you know, I've been working on this. Go fo focus on goals and plan and focus on goal and plan. And he said, and one day I looked outside when I was driving to work and there was this flower that had been there all the time and I'd never seen it. It was actually quite lovely. I looked at this flower and I thought, my goodness, this is beautiful. What flowers metaphorically am I not seeing in my life that my focus has limited mm. me? And he has a son. And he said, who was very young, three years old. And he said, my son, I'm, I, I, I love my son. And I'm being a good father, I think, but I'm missing the moment with him. He's the flower. I need to be in the moment instead of focused on the goal, even with him. And it just opened him up entirely, and he's just as effective as ever, but there's a, a way that he knows what it means to be and not just do. Yes, so they're almost too driven in a way. They're very focused, but too right. driven, and again, lose the, mm -hmm. the picture. Okay. And the grand fours. And your ground fours have a sense that uh, they're wired that there is a deeper connection between everything and all of us, but they can't quite feel it all the time, so they're constantly seeking it. And one of the ways I like to describe fours, their existential experience, is that whenever they think whoever made humans, if we came through on the conveyor belt, one human, you know, like in a store, do you call it a conveyor belt? Yeah. Okay. Yeah one human, the next human, that we all kind of look the same, but there's one that's different, even though it looks the same, and that's the four. And so they spend their lives trying to figure out, I'm different. Is it because I'm different because I'm deficient or not good enough? Is it I'm different because I'm better than? Am I just different? And so it's sort of a constant process of trying to figure out, why am I different? Why do I feel not quite like everybody else? Do I like it? Do I not like it? So it's all that, and eventually when they do their personal and spiritual growth, they realize that the, what's different about them is they think they're different, that we're all different, we're all the same, but it takes they have a liking of being different and a not sure they like being different. So in the organizational setting, um, one of the things that often happens is that, you know there's conflict and difficulties, and people are emotional because we bring our feelings to work. And so when Forrest talk about it leader as leaders or as place, they actually like to listen to people talk about difficult situations so people can feel deeply heard and they can spend hours on this, whereas many other le leaders or, or even coworkers will go, okay, I, I think enough already, you know, we got to get back to work. But they really have a capacity and a pleasure in listening and really going deeply into things with people. So that's four. Okay. So let me go to five. Yep. Enneagram Style 5 believe that it's possible to know everything. It's, that's what they're seeking. But they want to know everything that's of interest to them. But then, you know, it's an endless possibility of, and, of knowing. And their worldview is that the, although you can know everything, that the world is full of scarce resources. So you have to be careful about managing your time, your energy, your privacy, your relationships. And they tend to lead with their minds and disconnect or cut off from their emotions sometimes in their bodies too um, in this pursuit of knowledge. So their, their lifelong task of course is to reconnect because true wisdom or knowledge comes from knowing from the mind and the heart and the full experience. So there's a, a wonderful five leader I got in my mind and people would say to him, I don't know you, who are you? I want to know more of you. And he was like, what is it you want to know? So finally he's with his leadership group. And this comes up and he goes, well, what is it you want to know? And he said, and he, they say, well, we just want to know you. Well, I think in many ways they want to feel that he knows them. It's really, but they put it as him. 
So we said, okay, ask me a question. And so they said, one woman said, well, when I say good morning to you in the hallway, how are you? And you don't, you just say, fine, I want to know more. And he said, do you really want to know what I'm feeling, thinking? And she said, yes. I said, she said, well, actually, I feel like it's a superficial comment. You don't really want to know who I am or how I am. Maybe I had a bad day. Maybe I had a good morning. But I'm supposed to just say, I'm fine, and how are you, and smile at you. And I don't like those what feel to be more superficial interactions. And I think that's a real good insight into the fives. One level, they don't like these sort of what you call social interactions. But at another level, they spend a lot of time in self-reflection. So often they do know quite deeply, but they just don't share. Mm. And they do have feelings, but they often go off later and sort of reflect on them and then experience keep it them to in themselves, a deeper way. Yeah. Okay, now sixes. sixes, yeah. Sixes are very complex individuals. I'm a six, so I, I know, know that. I know you are. <laughs> it's like sixes can be, um, they're very different from one another, and different, the same six can be very different at different moments. But the basic worldview of the six is that they're seeking, they're seeking meaning and certainty and support in the world, and they are looking for it, and they can't exactly find it all the time, so they find it, try to find it for themselves. And so they have antenna that scan, say, well, what's really going on here? And what in my heart, you know, what am I feeling here? And what's going to happen? So they like to be able to predict things. And of course you can't because there's so many things going on, but sixes think they can. So what some sixes are more fearful because they were looking around to see what could happen and to do anticipatory planning. And some sixes are fearful too, but they go against the fear to uh, prove to themselves that they're not fearful at all. And some sixes are in between, more fearful, but can be quite bold, or quite fear not fearful at all, but have some moments. So um, I'll share a funny story about an Enneagram author who's a six. You know, I will keep names out of this, who's more on the counterphobic or against the fear. And so um, at one point, I was president of the International Enneagram Association, and we were having a conference in Washington, D.C. And the alerts, you know, after 9-11, they would go to different colors. And there had been a threat in New York and one in Washington. And so the alert had gotten heightened. And everybody in the country was aware of this because it was all over the news. So I'm the president of the association. And he writes me an email three days before the meetings to start. And I'm already in Washington for a board meeting. And he's about this much taller than I am, which is sort of relevant to the story. So he writes, I think you should write, email all the participants who are coming to the conference, and we're talking about three or 400 people, that the uh, alert is heightened and that you can protect them. Okay. And I'm sitting there going like, oh, well, everybody, know, you know what I mean? It's like the, the desire, the fantasy to let people know the fear came up, which we rarely see in this particular person because he's more, sh doesn't show the fear and goes against the fear and very tall, but I'm thinking, I can't protect any, any more than he can. He's this much taller than me anyway, and there's all these armed guards around, so they're going to be doing it. But it's the idea of telling authority that you need to tell people and you'll protect them. I found very amusing, even in the less fearful of the sixes. Hmm. And I just laughed and didn't send an email out. But I have, it made a wonderful story. Okay. Can you see me protecting the, all of Washington, D.C. Yeah, against no. terrorists? I mean, yeah. I could be nice and tell them not to do it, but what am I going to do? Um, so the sevens. The sevens live in a world where they think that they're, the world is full of possibilities and a much bigger plan for all of us, but they can't quite figure out what that plan is. So they think it's their job to try to create all this planning of possibilities. It's an Enneagram style that seeks pleasure and stimulation and wants to avoid discomfort or pain. So the idea in the seven is um, if things get a little tough, I'll just think about what I'm gonna do or a new thing that could happen or possibilities. So one of the ways I like to describe sevens in work settings because it works pretty well is you think about the seven mind as a computer screen where there's very few file folders. Every document is there on the desktop. So when one thing happens, it makes them think of another very quickly because they don't have to go deep into the file folders. So there's this called the synthesizing mind of the seven, which, oh, well, that makes me think of this and that makes me think of that. So they can put together innovative, creative ideas, which are very stimulating, can often be very helpful in organizations. And they're, but their real challenge is also to focus on which of these ideas 
we could actually take to conclusion. Which of these ideas really can um, be most useful to the organization? And what is the downside of the idea? Because they don't so much like to think about the downside of anything too long. So my one of my very favorite clients who's actually been an inspiration for the leadership book, Okay. I have to say, seven. One of the ways he's working on himself, because he likes to be the idea creator, is at his senior executive meetings, he focuses people on the agenda. So instead of being the one to come up with all the ideas, he encourages others to come up with them and he helps focus them. And it's almost like a psychological and spiritual development avenue for him. And he just laughs at himself. And what he does, that he's very, one day, because sevens often like to talk a lot, and sometimes they're very introverted, but they talk inside their minds. So you can have one seven I know doesn't stop talking. I spent like uh, about 14 hours with him and he just didn't stop talking the whole time. I know another seven who doesn't talk at all, but the chatter is still there. So this client of mine, he goes on the silent retreats. Started with one day, two days. Huh. Now he's up to seven and he now loves it because he's found that the inside is just as fascinating as the outside, maybe more so. So that's the seven eights. I've had a lot of eight clients, but I'll t so I have many stories about them. But eights believe that the world, that it's possible to understand the true reality, the real truth in the world. And they're looking for the truth, and they feel that it's their job to do so. But inside, they believe that the world is made up of two kinds of people, the tough and the weak. So they've learned to be the strong or the tough and hide their invulnerability, which they would see as weakness, and to protect other people that they see as structurally weak. Although interestingly, if somebody looks like a victim to them uh, that who isn't a real victim, according to that particular eight, they have disdain for people who victimize themselves in their mind, but want to protect those who are true victims. So they rise up to the occasion and it's, and it's about being bold, and it's about being strong, and it's about being assertive, but hiding one's own vulnerability and one's own sort of tender-heartedness. So, eights are, when they get the Enneagram, it can be the biggest breakthrough in the world for them, because they love the moment of recognizing that true strength comes from accepting and owning one's vulnerability as well as one's power and it's that meeting uh, the moment because they do love the truth and the mm. Enneagram can feel like that to them but it, they have to um, be willing to be vulnerable in order to get there which is sort of it's quite difficult the, for them it can it? be a challenge but it can be yeah. a huge breakthrough nines um, believe that the world is full of unconditional regard and harmony and yet there's all this tension everywhere and they see it as their jobs to bring people together. So they become good listeners, they become facilitators, they like to draw other people out and bring it together. Um, they don't like to create conflict themselves, and so they mediate or harmonize often at the expense of expressing their own true self, their own true voice, their own true thoughts, their true feelings. So that's the, the development path for the nine, is to find out what they really believe and to be able to take a position and to be able to follow through on it. So, the, the, I wanted this, there's a woman in, in uh, one of my groups and I have great, the greatest respect for her, she's a nine. And she's lovely and smart and talented. And one day she came to one of these meetings where we were, were, had been working on development for several months. And people looked at her and they said, Maria, what happened to you? She said, well, I'm 45 years old. She's a nine. And I was looking in the mirror and I looked and I said, Maria, you're 45 years old. If you're not going to speak up for yourself now, when? Are you going to wait till you're 55, 65? She just decided. She had, she had grandchildren who were young. She said, I owe it to myself. I owe it to my grandchildren. I owe it to, I just want to. If not now, when? Now is the time. And so she just started speaking her voice, saying what she thought, not waiting till the end of meetings to find out to what other people thought and then say what she wanted in a kind of unassertive way. And if she, were not, she was always a good leader, but she became an exemplary leader. So those are the nine styles. Okay, good. 
And so when you go into an organisation, into a business, mm -hmm. are you pretty much scanning people to work out their styles or are you patient with that? How, does, how, how, do, you, how do you get the information and how do you implement that information? Okay. So the only place I usually try to figure out what somebody's type is, is when I'm at an airport and I have a long wait and I'm bored. <laughs> and then I'll see people walking on and go, I wonder if that person is this type or that type. But when I go into a company, I actually have materials that help people discover their own type for themselves that are interactive. Okay, so it's giving the power back to them again in terms it's of... It's a lot about bringing the yeah, power back to them. Yeah. But you know what else it is? The saying, you can't judge a book by its cover. Many of the types do the same things, but for different reasons. Yeah. So what I've discovered is that when I... I've gotten you know, more experienced with this, and I may be a little better about guessing if a person might be this type or that type after I've been with them for a while. But you cannot, I don't think anybody, and if they think they can, I think they maybe want to think, rethink this. It's so hard to tell from the outside what somebody's type is. So I have these materials that help people do it for themselves that they can use individually or better in groups because the, the process of typing and people, there's some cards and some other things, but. They get pretty close, and then once they get more clear, they get to see, and they do activities with people, so they can see how different types, uh, the nine different types, respond to different, the same stimulus. You know, okay. what makes you anger? Uh, you know, what kind of triggers your anger? What, are, what you're, and how do you respond? They see what kind, and why, and they see, and what's the development? Because usually when we get upset, it's our own type that's getting triggered. So. People can work on their own development. They can see how much their own responses are related to type. And that's what I do in organizations or leadership. Why do you see it this way? Well, it's your paradigm of leadership versus that. Not right or wrong. Paradigms by their nature are limited. And do you find that people find it relatively easy to identify their own type and style? or? Well, easy. They have to go do some work. I mean, they have to go inward and look at their patterns. There. Yeah. They have to be, to some degree, self-aware enough to even see what their patterns are. So is that easy? Well, it depends on the person. But if there's oh, enough openness and enough self-awareness, I think I mean, most of the time I'll go into an organization or I train people to use these materials and they go into organizations and usually within about two hours or less, I can get most of the people, whether they're leaders or non-leaders, to get pretty 85% to identify their type pretty accurately. But I'm very focused on what I do. And the rest of them maybe need a little bit longer, need to do some reflection, maybe are confusing one type with another. And really, they're people who can study the Enneagram for a month and then discover that they aren't the type they thought they were. Some people are a little more complex, have parental overlays, or you have a strong parent. So you think, well, gee, I may be this type, but it's underneath it, you're this, with a little bit of that other type overlaid. Yeah, so really it's a tool for people to know themselves better. When they know themselves better, they can act in a more intelligent way and presumably they also get to know other people better too. It develops compassion and appreciation instead of irritation and annoyance. Yeah. But I do think that, first of all, I think of the Enneagram more as a map than a tool. Okay. Like it's a map to the inner interior. I've seen some people, which I do not teach it this way, just use it to go, oh, well, that's why I do this, this, and this, but not use it for development. So I think it's a map to the interior a great opening for development and an incredible opportunity for compassion both for other people and for oneself. Because I know that one of the things that I do in uh, my work environment is if I'm having a difficulty with somebody, yeah. i.e. we're not seeing eye to eye on something or we have a different style in terms of how we approach things, I'm mm -hmm. working out in my mind what their Enneagram type may be. And if, and I don't know whether I get it right or not, but if, it's almost as if I'm putting myself in their shoes right. and I'm thinking, well, how are they thinking? Mm -hmm. How are they feeling? Why are they taking the position they are? How are they seeing me? Mm -hmm. And 
by doing that, I find that I understand them much better. Mm -hmm. And it's, I understand why they're, in my eyes, being difficult or not wanting to understand what I'm trying to put across. Right. And it can change. It's like, it's like it almost creates a field between us because there's a kind of there's me trying to right. sit there with mm -hmm. uh, where they are. And it, it, it's, it, it's not always something that comes straight away. And it's, I don't always get the answer I want. But something opens up. So I, I like that story because whether you're right or wrong, at least you're considering the other, that the other person has a point of view and it gives you something to do instead of just reacting out of your own personality. Now, I'm going to tell a story about this because I think it's a great story. If you imagine that you actually knew the other person's point of view, what their type was, and that other person knew his or her own type, then think about how that conversation might go. So, but, because it tells me, a, there's a story that I love. It's, I don't tell untrue stories because they're never as good as the real ones and I'm not good at telling fake <laughs> stories. Anyway, anyway, so I had asked one of my key clients, um, two, two people, very high level, vice president, senior vice president, and a vice president to come to an Enneagram conference to talk about the use of it in, the Enneagram in their company and how we were doing it. And one, there were like 70 people in the audience, and one of the audience members said, well, how do you deal with the fact that the Enneagram doesn't have a multitude of research to show that it is a valid system and all the benefit it brings? And he said, the man who was, uh, stood up, one of the clients said, he's a five, well, so you normally, he just really rose to the occasion, and he stood up, which normally fives would, wouldn't necessarily stand up. He took the microphone, he said, and he's a research scientist, one of the most respected, three most respected people in this very large, successful company. He said, I'm a scientist, so let me tell you about research. You can make the research go any direction you really want it to, and you can look at the research uh, process and find all kinds of uh, questions about it. I know how to do that very well. So if you tried to convince me about the endogram, through research, I would be picking at the pieces of it, trying to find what the, how it wasn't structured in a logical way. He said, but, so I, don't, I know about research, but let me tell you this. There's a senior vice president, I'm a five, and there's a senior vice president in the company who's an eight. And for the last 15 years, we haven't been able to get along. And it has completely impaired our senior leadership group from functioning. But once he recognized that I was into the Enneagram and knew my type, and I recognized his, and we both realized we were using it in our respective organizations, we had a conversation about it yeah, and about our relationship. And he said, in 20 minutes, we uh, were able to un get undo what for the last 15 years or 10, 12 to 15 years had been a problem for us. Now, not only do we work effectively together, we've actually become good friends. So you found a way of meeting at a That's what he said. Yeah. So he said, don't yeah. tell me about, he said to this group, don't tell me about research. Let me tell you about reality. This yeah. is what it can do. Yeah. No, it, it, that's very interesting, and uh, we have to finish in a few minutes, but one thing that I did note down from, you mentioned mm -hmm. one of your books, was the CIA mm -hmm. actually used the Enneagram, which I found, again, quite fascinating. How do they actually use it? Do you well, know? see, I don't know because um, I wasn't the person, I didn't think when they were using it, I didn't really even know the Enneagram so well, but as I understand it from, I have to be careful, you know, because a little bit, but a colleague did, um, was to do their best guess at what uh, the Enneagram type was of some of the foreign leaders whom they needed to deal with and to right. be able to predict behavior. Because, see, the problem is if you can, the Enneagram can be highly predictive of behavior. The issue is you have to know the person's style accurately. So they use someone who's a very knowledgeable Enneagram person and uh, to try to do this. And so that's the story. And so, you know, yeah, I don't know if they're still using it, but um, they did it at one point. Yeah, well, it makes a lot of sense. And also, um, I wrote down here, the Federal Reserve Bank uses it as well. Is that via you or just something you found well, the out? Well, um, they don't like so much when we talk about it. Um, okay. But I do... It's, it's in your book. I so know, it's but it, it's okay. Um, but they don't like to be, have the work exactly talked about. But the, one of the branches of the Federal Reserve Bank has uses it, and they've been using. They were one of the early users, and th they bring a number of Enneagram people in to teach them. So when I go back tomorrow, the following week, I'm going to be going up there yeah. doing some work with them. It's yeah. their 
you know, one of the people that um, really use it in great in a great many great ways. Yeah, which shows you there's a lot of industries that can use it because my example of the five and eight story is from a pharmaceutical, very big biotech pharmaceutical company. We've got banking industry, we've got governments, numbers. You know, it's like the industries um, spans industry. And is is it on the increase in terms of? Oh, definitely. Uh, yeah. Oh, definitely. I think, um, you know, 10 years ago, if you said to, took 10 people at random who were reasonably educated, who worked, you know, and you said, um, have you ever heard of the Enneagram? Uh. The, mostly, no. Now, what I'm hearing myself and what other people are saying, you take 10 reasonable, you know, and you say, have you ever heard of the Enneagram? One person vaguely, at three people, yes. One vaguely, but isn't sure what is some, the second person a little bit, and the third person would actually use it him or herself or know somebody very close who did. So it's an increasing usage, I think. Oh, great. Okay, well, it's been very interesting, Ginger. Thanks for coming in. Um, I'm going to just show your, your books again, Bringing Out the Best in Yourself at Work. <laughs> the, bringing Out the best, of, best in Everyone You Coach. And what type of leader are you? So these are all books that are available uh, to learn more about the Enneagram. And so hopefully if you've been triggered by this program, you'll uh, get one of the books and find out more about it and uh, practically incorporate it in your life. It certainly worked in my life. So thank you again for watching Conscious TV to remind you we've been talking about the Enneagram and we'll have more programs in this series. And I hope we see you again soon. Goodbye.